aren't you guys that had enough of me by now? <laughs> there were two old guys who'd known each other for a long time. They went up to a bar. They were talking, talking. One finally said, you know, time's going on pretty fast. The other guy looked at him and said, yeah, you see those two guys down there in the bar? He said, another 15 years, that's what you and I are going to look like. The other guy said, that's the mirror being bad. <laughs> Brian, a little kid, was out in the uh, in a baseball lot, and he had a bat on his shoulder and a ball in his hand. And he threw the ball up in the air, and he took a swing at it, and he missed it. But he wasn't discouraged. He reached down and picked up that ball again. He said, I am the best baseball hitter in the world. I am going to soon take over the world. I'm going to be such a good baseball uh, hitter. And he threw the ball up for the second time. And he took a mighty swing, and he missed it again. He reached down and picked it up and looked at that, that ball with a scrowl on his face. He said, I am the best baseball hitter in the world. And he threw that ball up, and it got to its, its highest point. It started coming down again. The guy had his eye on it, and he took a swing at it again, hardest swing yet, and he missed it. And he reached out and picked up that ball and said, I am the best pitcher in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Is that in focus? Can you make, can you make that up? Uh, yesterday we were talking about, uh, how many people came in today expecting to hear about the uh, secret warning house? All right, it's a bait and switch. I got you in here, I'm going to tell you about something else. <laughs> Yesterday we talked about the secret war in Laos. That Brent and I arrived in Udorn. Uh, we adopted our kids. She moved up to Vientiane, where I was spending almost all of my time in a place called Long Chin, that valley, and the skyline ridge that protected us to the north. That's 200 miles from downtown Hanoi. Uh, and we were there because uh, Eisenhower, in one of his last acts as president, in December 1960, or early January 1961, I don't know the exact date, when he gave us uh, permission to start a covert action in support of the Hills tribes people here to fight off the, uh, the North Vietnamese. Because it wasn't much for the North Vietnamese to move down and put pressure on Viet Chen and bring Laos into their sphere of influence. So that was the secret part of the war, uh, that we were working with the uh, we were spies, we were recruited CIA, we were working uh, in civilian clothes uh, with the Hmong uh, to uh, stop the North Vietnamese. Everything changed in 1968 uh, when uh, Nixon came in and Johnson went out um, and the North Vietnamese were more aggressive, they were more assertive, and they came with bigger numbers and they came in North Vietnamese units, whereas before 68 they did not. And our Hmong could not take them on. Our Hmong were uh, young hills tribesmen, they were stout-hearted. The Hmongs were so easy to like. They had no experience with the internal combustion engine, had no experience with electricity and flying in planes, but they were honest, straightforward people. They had a democratic uh, tradition. They elected the Naiban, who was the village chief, he didn't do the job, they'd get rid of him. And, uh, get in another one. The Nai Bonds reported to Nai Khans, who reported up to Bang Pao, who was the chief there in Long Chin. The white Hmong were all around the Plain de Jars. And this is this strikingly beautiful part of Mother Earth. It's as striking as when you first see the Grand Canyon. Because in these rugged mountains there at the foothills of the, the Himalayas is this out of nowhere plateau of uh, some waving uh, uh, savanna grass. And it has been a place, uh, sort of the center of Southeast Asia, an ancient trading place and an ancient battlefield. But it's, it's, it's where the Hmong dominated. It was their homeland. Uh, we contacted uh, Bang Pao in 1960, uh, and he agreed if we would provide him some advisors and some transportation and some guns, that he would, uh, he would work with us, not work with us, that he would fight the North Vietnamese. He hated the communists. For number one, you know, they were small um, 
Asian minority the Hmong Hills tribes and they didn't want the communists of Hanoi coming in and telling them what to do. So we gave them a way to defend their homeland and also to protect the U.S. equities, which was to maintain a neutral, a, a, a mutual loss. Um, for two years I, I worked with the, with the Hmong at a time that they were being overpowered by the North Vietnamese. And the Thais came to our support. The Thais just lost their king. Um, if you've had any experience uh, and have good friends with Thais, you'll know that's taken away part of who they are. Because the king played a part in every Thais soul. The Thais are very family oriented. But the king plays a part there. He's sort of the supreme being in their world. The supreme mortal. The king understood the dangers the North Vietnamese posed. He understood how uh, vulnerable the Hmong were, how they could not possibly hold out the North Vietnamese. Uh, so he uh, authorized and he called his own a group called the Tahan Sur Prat. The military, Thai military designation was 333. And the Thai military facilitated the recruitment of these young soldiers off the streets of Bangkok, right outside the gates to prison, uh, on the beaches down around Phuket, up in the rice field. And it was a pretty easy recruitment because we paid a good salary. Uh, and because the United States government was underwriting the cost of this. And there was a very good death benefit of $20,000. If one of these gentlemen were to die in battle, then their family would get $20,000, which was an unheard of sum out of the countryside. And for some of them who had not lived um, a prize-winning uh, young life, uh, they could redeem themselves and sort of regain family honor by returning on their death $20,000 to the family. The first two years of 601 and 602, they were assigned down in the uh, lower part of Thailand, and they took on the Arden, uh, not the Arden, North Vietnamese 9th Regiment, and they ripped their shirt and kicked them in the butt. They had in their first battle, uh, the North Vietnamese had about 150 dead in the wire uh, after the first night of battle. And the Tahan Sur Prat lost one dead and one wounded. And recruitment surged. People were standing in line uh, to sign up for this uh, before the sun came up in the morning. Units 602 and 603 came up to us in Long Chen to bail out um, a unit of uh, Roy Thai Army that was being attacked by the North Vietnamese Colonel Chong, who was commander of the 165th Regiment. And they acquitted themselves the 601, uh, 602 and 603, 603 and 604, in a marvelous way. There was some doubt back in Washington. This was a very closely held program. My last book, The Vietnam War, its own self, I described the program in some detail. But it took me two years to get it cleared at the CIA because this was such a closely held um, program of using Thai nationals to fight North Vietnamese in, uh, in a third country, Laos. Um, and the king's involvement, they wanted to keep secret. But after a period of time, you know, there, there is no secret about it. There's nothing, no national security that's going to be uh, uh, hurt by exposing the program. So, the, but there's a lot of concern back in Washington for no other reason than cost. Uh, are these guys going to be worth it? Uh, and they, they proved marvelous uh, at their job. Because the king had said go and uh, put a piece of gold speck, a speck of gold behind your boot or around your neck, and know that you are there for me, that you are my men up there. And the words to the impossible dream. Does anybody remember the words? Do you know them? Sing them. <laughs> Right, it's to, to, to strive uh, and to reach for, for things uh, without any recognition. So the Tahan Sur Pran were there and we deployed them on the PDJ when the North Vietnamese began to marshal for war. We did not know at the time and we did not know until just a few years ago. They broke down 27,000 soldiers to kill Vang Pao, to kill the Americans and to occupy Long Chen. 27,000 people. They brought in 130 guns, they brought in sappers, they brought in artillery, they brought in uh, uh, their engineers, 
and the attack of the morning of 18 December 1971. Brenda and I arrived in November. They kept me down in Udorn, in this lower place here. Uh, there. Uh, because there was so much paperwork involved back in Washington. There's so many people on the inside, so many people in the intelligence community, the paramilitary community, that were interested in this fight. Because if the North Vietnamese overran the Tahan Sua Khan, uh, then Laos was lost. Uh, this is in 70, and it would have ended the war uh, if Laos suddenly pitched in with the North Vietnamese. So there was a lot of concern within the inner circles, and that's Kissinger and Nixon at the top. Uh, who were concerned. They attacked the morning of 18 August with almost 27,000 shoulder to shoulder. Uh, they attacked in waves. Uh, they attacked uh, bringing more people than we had guns. Our main position, Mustang, Lion, and King Kong, were overrun by the night of uh, December the 19th. And we fell back. Those forces fell back to Long Chin. We expected them to have to come through the Benintan Pass but they didn't. They came over the big mountain uh, and they arrived in it in front of Skyline Ridge, tired uh, and beat up because they had taken so many casualties in Rouston, the uh, town so abroad. We lost, I don't know, 2,000 good Thai soldiers when they uh, took over the, the PBJ. Uh, the North Vietnamese had reduced strength too. One of the things, uh, the Kissinger was talking to Nixon one time, and he told Nixon, uh, we're not going to last. There's just no bodies that we have to put up there. You're not going to commit U.S. troops, and, and we don't have the Asian forces there to, to stop them. And Nixon went on about how that with Laos gone, it really uh, it, uh, it was a harbinger of tar dark times ahead. What Kissinger did do, that's not captured on that tape that, that I heard, is that he authorized our release, our targeting of B-52s. We knew there were marshalling in front of Skyline, that ridge line I showed you yesterday. And we knew that there was one place in particular where they could be hiding. And we called in three B-52s uh, B and one, one box, arc-like box, and it blew the 866 reg regiment all to peace. And I think it turned the war. That and the, the hang of the um, the time so a crime. Uh, they attacked, uh, but it was sort of faint. It was sent sappers up to die, and, and they died, it seemed like, by the dozens. Uh, the north side of Skyline Ridge was, was littered with dead. And again, this, there were only about a dozen of the case officers, 16 at the most, uh, out working with the Asians, the thousands of Asians. But it worked because we would have as obsessists. Uh, Asians that uh, knew the language and it sort of anticipated what, what we wanted to do. We were also aided by people like Shep Johnson, uh, the, the great, great, great Shep Johnson, who was the single guy in that uh, rigging ship who got all the stuff out, got all the bullets out, got all the food out, got all the grenades out. Uh, and then Air America, who would go in the middle of the, of the, the battlefield with those unarmored helicopters that they would bring out the wounded bring out the, uh, the dead and bring in the, the food and the ammunition and the ardent, and those really light, non-armored uh, O-1 bird dog planes that were flying overhead looking for the enemy for fast movers that were coming in. And they would, I would be out in the field with my troops and, and as I said, the H-1 speed was a, still a good friend of ours. Uh, would, was one of the ravens and he'd say, Mule, give me a target. Got some fast movers going to be on target here in about 10 minutes. And I'd say, well, we were getting some fire this morning from over here next to the mountain. See that peak there? And he would see it. And he would fall out of the sky to, draw, to, to that point to try and draw fire so that when the fast movers arrived on the scene, uh, he would know where to uh, for a hundred days, that battle raged. Bang Pao had a great fit uh, in sending some of his mom to act as if they're going to cut off their supply lines, and they had to pull back the North Vietnamese, pull back half their forces to protect their side of their their uh, supply lines. We brought in more Tahan Sua Pran, uh, and then it came down to a question of Hill 1800. They were building a road down. They could bring their tanks down. Now we could, we couldn't beat tanks. 
We can beat those sappers climbing up the hill. We could beat those guys that didn't come in so big, so many numbers. But tanks, tanks can kill you in a, in a trench. Uh, so they're bringing the tanks down, and Bang Powell, Bang Powell, our, our uh, warlord uh, chief there, he was pleased with that. Because you don't use tanks in mountains. You know, there's only so many places a tank can go, and you can't hide a tank in the mountain very much. They got to be in the valley. They ain't up on the side of the hill. Uh, and they brought him down, and, and they're going to have to go to the Bad Hand Time Pass. And then after that was Hill 1800. So the big question in our minds out there, and six of us case officers, and, and Bang Powell and his planners, and, uh, was um, what do we do about this? And Bang Powell said they're not going to be able to climb 1800 with their tanks. And the Army and back in the Pentagon and those on the inside of this program were jumping up and down, and yes, they can, it's possible. Bang Powell said they aren't going to be able to climb 1800 with their tanks. And sure enough, we've gotten an after action report from the engineers, and they did everything. They did everything. They only could work at night, they couldn't work in the daytimes because we had, we had been all of them. But at night, we. We, we just couldn't, didn't have the coverage, except for the specters who go and work here on 1800. But this was, this was the thing. If they climbed up 1800, they'd be on the high ground, and they could come around and attack Skyline Ridge. But we put, based on Van Powell, based on that one guy's uh, uh, commitment, one guy's uh, knowledge of the area, we put our Tahans, uh, so I put about 5,000 in this valley right in front of Skyline. So if those tanks were going to attack us, to be used against us, they were going to have to wade through those columns of run. And sure enough, they couldn't fly 1,800. Some great, great reading. If, because I was there, and I heard Bang Powell defending it to anybody that would listen. They can't climb 1,800. And then to read the North Vietnamese after action reports, and they couldn't climb 1,800. So they had to come, and they slogged their way through those 5,000 columns of run, and they got chewed up. We, uh, we, uh, we ate their lunch, we ripped their shirts, uh, and we destroyed almost all of the tanks they had sent down, except for three. We knocked out the, the two tanks after about 100 days of fighting, and General Ahn, who had gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, Colonel Hal Moore in the Audrain Valley in 65, said, no mas, gave it up. What was reported back to Washington then and to Nixon is that those Asians, they did hold out. Uh, and they did. It, they, they lost it. They paid a price. They paid a heavy price. But they killed the North Vietnamese and, and they, um, uh, two to one, uh, three to one, four to one. Uh, they said half the force, only about half the force, they could sway back to North Vietnam. So that would mean they lost ten or twelve thousand dollars at the time. It wasn't, it wasn't in the news. Only news it was on was on the front pages of two Hanoi papers of January the 14th, 1972. And they said, we have captured Lung Chin, we have killed Dang Pao, Laos is ours. Front page is like the, uh, the Truman and who was the guy? Dewey. Uh, Dewey? Uh, yeah, Dewey. Dewey beat Truman. Nah, he didn't. We hung out. And we hung out because the Vietnamese of the uh, Lung did not leave the valley. They stayed in the valley. 5,000 Lung were still in the valley because of the hang of the Tan Surapran, and because we went to work every day, and we showed up. That's the, for you guys that were not here yesterday, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is um, the evacuation from Vietnam. So the ceasefire came into Laos not long after that battle. The, uh, uh, there's supposed to be a coalition government. The North Vietnamese were not able to, to take uh, Laos militarily. So I was transferred from uh, Laos to Vietnam. The military had pulled out in 73, about the same time as the last ceasefire. And I was assigned down in the Delta. That's not who I was assigned. <laughs> down in the Delta of Canto. So I'm moving from the mountains of Laos, 200 miles from downtown Hanoi, all the way down here. This is where I had served as a GI, 65 to 66, with the 1st Division. Um, and my platoon was in Kuchi, Rintanian, Minton, 
So that was the area. So coming down, it almost took a new set up, a new wardrobe, and a new set of clothes. Uh, so we left, we left Ben Chen, Brendan, the two kids. We stopped at the Kahala Hilton. I tell you, that became part of our, our uh, routine. As every time we went to Hawaii, we, we, in Oahu, we would stop at the Kahala Hilton. That was in the uh, lobby. Went back to, went back to Langley for a briefing about what was going on in Vietnam, and it was not not good words. It wasn't good information that I got. This is uh, the main building. That's the West parking lot. So when you come back, you have to park in the West parking lot, and you have to troop all the way around here uh, to the very front uh, and go in. But it's always it's always good. That's a good walk when you come back to the field. These were the stars on the wall about the time I started. Uh, these are the stars on the wall today. You can see the, and they represent the lives of the CIA men who have died. But right behind you, you'd come in and the badge office is right behind this wall. And you would go in and get your badge. Now, later on, when I was uh, chief of station and going out in the field uh, as an operations officer, um, in the field, you never felt safe. Working out of an embassy, you never felt safe. Picking up the telephone, you never felt secure. And uh, a gin and tonic was part of the uniform overseas. And you're often dealing with other intelligence officers from other services. Now, if you were a manager uh, in the CIA, after a while you know all of your operations, and you know all the operations of your men. And that's up there. Uh, and you have to keep a governor. You have to block it away and put it in the safe. And you're drinking all the time with these people, and you're tired sometimes. And they are professionals, the guys that you're dealing with. They know how to extract the information. Uh, and even around the house, unfortunately, my wife also worked for the CIA. And the only really time outside of my office that I felt comfortable was in talking was uh, in bed at night at the talk, where we could almost whisper and talk about stuff. So there was no time away from headquarters that you felt safe. No time until you walked by those stars that went into the badge office and got your badge. Okay, what do you say, Uh So if there's any great return on your investment as a CIA guy who sees the, the hardships, the danger, it's that great feeling you have when you come back and you get your badge and you walk down the halls of blind and say, so anyway, I, I came back, I uh, got my badge, we stopped at Kahala Hilton on the way back, uh, and we ended up uh, on the top of Yangon Shot, which is a mountain that only looks Taipei, Taiwan. We were down in this choice location, down in the heart of Taipei, but the kids, did I tell you this? The, the, the kids found out there was a mortuary, dead people, in, in our neighborhood, and they didn't like it anymore. So we moved to the top of the that's an overlook near our house in Taipei. So my operations went from this area, put the family in Taipei, and I'm going to the, to the Delta. And there's no flights directly from Saigon into Taipei, so it always stopped off in, in, um, in Hong Kong. And what I would often do in Hong Kong is take the star ferry over to Kulon. In coming into Saigon, they sent me down to Kanto, and Jim Delaney was my boss, and he sent me up to Chada. And I worked with um, worked cross-border operations in the Cambodia, and boy, that's unsettling. The war that we knew of, the media uh, provided coverage of in Vietnam, is nothing, it's nothing as horrific as it was in Cambodia, where they have not a very high regard for human life. Stay there until. I got a call and uh, a request to go down to Detox. Chong Tien, Detox. Um, I said, sure, I'll go. Let's go. And I went there, there was one other American. This was our compound. It sort of squeezed in. Uh, you can see how well fortified it is. The North Vietnamese came and the VCK. Not much chance, you know, we're going to hold them off with the uh, chicken wire. But uh, that was the compound. And we were okay as long as uh, we felt comfortable, that the VC felt comfortable that we were there. We sort of had a, a little, little, little attitude. My roommate was Terry Barker. He was uh, USAID. 
We used to joke, we stayed in this house and we left over here. We used to joke, if the D.C. came in, they'd be looking for the CIA guy, it's me, Jimmy Parker. Now I'd have to tell you, you just got the names wrong. It's Terry Barker, and he's in the next bedroom. <laughs> you know, uh, Terry dealt with uh, the, the military in Vietnam, Chung Tin. That's uh, General Hung. Uh, and then they called Terry out. So I went to my guard, Loy, and I said, Loy, you are now my not compound guard. You are my personal guard. I want you to get between me and danger. If I die, I've got to see your sorry ass in front of me in line there in front of me. Your job is to get between me and danger. Your job, Loy, from here on out, if you want to, I'm going to give you another raise, is to take spears to the chest. You got it? Before I do. You die before I do. Okay, boss, I'll do it. What's a spear? <laughs> that was Loy, and he became my, my shadow. This, this story is, is it's hard to believe, but it really happened. So I'm in the bed one night. I'm the only um, uh, American in that little house. And uh, Lloyd knows what his instruction, he knows it's what his uh, marching orders are. And around, zinged overhead to the market. Was it involved with the American war against South Vietnam? No. It was the D.C. who were trying to punish somebody in the market for not paying his, his D.C. dues. Rocket goes over, zoom, blows up in the village. I don't hear nothing. I'm sleeping in the air conditioning. <laughs> Loy hears it though. He wakes up, comes out by the window, says, Boss man, boss man, boss man, boss man. Ooh. Three or four uh, went over our house and landed in the marketplace. Finally, Loy breaks through the front screen, breaks in the door, and I'm in the bed just to wake it up as this Asian body comes flying <laughs> towards me. And it was just like Tom, uh, this, uh, the uh, Peter Sellers movies, you know, fight mouth and uh, I could, he wouldn't let me get to my gun. I mean, he knew that. But uh, so we had the, the Christmas, but I'm still big on orphanage. That was my great relief in uh, in Vita. And I struck up this friendship with General Hong. And there were three divisions, three Arden divisions in the South. The 21st, General Hong was the commander. The 7th, General Hai was commander. And the 9th, Nito, and I forgot who was the commander. So when Terry left, I left to play ping pong, to get deep playing ping pong with uh, with Lloyd. And I would go over to, to talk with Joe Hong. Joe Hong's English was uh, measured. He understood much more than, than he could speak. But he asked good questions. And he had such a warm and inviting disposition. You just, I just felt comfortable. So this war was going on. We were surrounded in Vietnam by DC. But uh, when I'm with, Joe Hong, it was just, it was good. And it wasn't, you know, laugh, laugh, and, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but it was just mellow and good. And he and I developed a, a friendship. I've been fortunate in my, uh, in my career. I, I think John Sherman, who I mentioned some time before, was a good friend, and Joe Hong was a good friend. Um, beyond work, just talking about books we've read, or movies we've seen, or what we hope for our children, uh, that was Joe Hong. Then it came to be, is that washed out? Can you see that map? The, the province in red is Bambi Tour. That fell in early 1975 to the North Vietnamese. And we all knew that the end was near. Now we knew that in Canto. The embassy in Saigon said no. The North Vietnamese are not going to take over the entire South Vietnam. They're going to take over South Vietnam above Saigon. But Saigon and below is going to stay as a free country. And they got this idea, I'm not sure. I've heard rumors about how they came to have that idea, as crazy as it might sound. Uh, but Pogar, who was our chief of station, he bought into it. Frank Schnepp, who was the chief DDI guy, who was the chief briefer, the chief intelligence briefer for South Vietnam, he bought it. I didn't buy it. I thought the end uh, for South Vietnam was imminent. I had been involved in this war since 1965, and it didn't take, it didn't take a lot of convincing for me to understand we were now at the base in South Vietnam. This was January. They moved 
the Army did, General Hong from the 21st Division in Vita to Canto. And he was number two in command of all the Army south of Saigon. My boss, John Delaney, I tried to get in to see him, and he was just always going or too busy. I knew Joe Hung, and I knew all of his aides that sat outside that he took with him. So Delaney asked me to come up and talk with uh, Hung about some issues, and I, went, I knew all the guys. I went over, came back, and wrote up two or three intel reports. So it was a day or two after. No, that wasn't the first one. The second time, I came up to see Joe Hung, and nobody else could get it together and to see him, and we set out some uh, intel reports. He told me, General Hong, after we had talked, he had sort of the big picture. If Delaney wanted to write some, or wanted to have some coverage of what the Army General were thinking about our chances in the future of South Vietnam, I would go over and, and ask Hong and Hong would tell him. Hong said, one of the best sources of information of what's happened in the field is General High. General High's headquarters is on the Cambodian uh, South Vietnamese border, right under the Parrots. The uh, Seventh Division has been there for a long time, and they have been fighting the night uh, in the A Regiment for a long time. So I went out to meet General High, and that was that was uh, that was a thing. That was that was something to do. General High, although General Hong spoke very low, uh, slow-paced English. And he had a mellow disposition. This fellow could cuss like a sailor. This guy, I don't know how many bad words were in English like was nine, ten. He could mix all those words up together like I'd never heard before. <laughs> he called me things I'd never been called before or since. And he and his English was good. He was on top of it. But he was especially on expressing himself of American profanity. He could make those words stand up and dance. I mean, he would, he, he would make your eyes, you know, bug out a little bit the things that he called it. Uh, his, he had a GP medium tent. You have a GP small, and that's for, you know, company headquarters. But a GP medium and then a GP large is what they used the infantry for a whole squad or a whole half or two. He had a GP medium. His tent, I mean, his, uh, his desk was at the end. You open up the, and this is another thing, I don't ever remember opening a flap. Seems to me I opened the door, but how can there be a door in a GP media tent? But then you open the door, as I remember, and then there were pallets all the way down to his desk. And the only light was at his desk. Hmm. So you came in the first time, I think I knocked or, or went in, he's sitting behind the desk, saying, Air America fly me down. Uh, and they didn't like it because we were right next to the bad guys in Camp Hogan. So they dropped me off. I went in. Uh, he was expecting me. I had heard he spoke good English. Be careful, he said. He could really, he could really rag your butt. I opened it up, and there in the pilots, and I walked in, and my footfalls, you could hear them. He wasn't singing, he smoked a cigarette. So I introduced myself. He didn't sing anything, he smoked a cigarette. I sat down in some lawn, lawn furniture out the side. And he proceeded to chew me out. Chewed me out the way the Americans had prosecuted this war. Chewed me out to such a big, powerful country. He had been to the state several times for training. With all its resources, we getting pushed around by North Vietnam. It was bad policy, he said. You got the stuff. You, know, you can wipe them off the face of this earth. You just been, you're reacting to their initiatives. It's just piss poor out here in the, in the field. You're losing people hand over fist. Because of you. And then I realized while he was seeing me, I was the only guy that he could talk to anymore because the Americans were being drawn down. And he spoke English. He liked to speak English. knew the shock and awe he could get from Americans when he started cussing them. So he chewed me up and chewed me down. And then when he got to repeating himself, he gave me a pretty good briefing of what was going on. And a briefing in such depth because of his command of English that I went back and probably wrote three or four intel reports and sent them back to Washington. Now, um, our intel reports from the Delta were conflicting with the intel reports from Saigon. Saigon said, you know, all this is going on, it looks pretty bad, but believe me, Washington, they are not going to take Saigon. They're only going to get to the city gates and they're going to stop, they're going to sue for peace, we're going to accept it and we're going to be here forever. They want this outlet. They do not want all of the Delta. Uh, he thought that was hogwash. 
He said, they're coming. He also told me this, Joe High. He said, right across from me is a North Vietnamese sanctuary. And the troops are coming in every day. They're building up. Uh, they've got old troops and young troops. He said, I will know when they begin to think about launching towards Saigon, when they start lining up. Right now, they're coming in and they're just marching. It's just a big mess. Where are your B-52s now, Mr. CIA guy? I need your help. I'm your ally. Come help me. They're over there, about the thousands in front of me. Uh, and he needs spare parts. Now, how you mentioned this to me when we were down at the time? Hi was just all over me with that. Here, you're supposed to be still supplying us so we can carry this fight. But there's nobody that's allocating the parts we need. Nobody is reading our mail when we say we need this, this, and this. You just send us surplus spare parts. He had something like 20 helicopters for his division. But only like two or three were flying because they had to uh, uh, scavenge or uh, use parts of the other planes to supply his own. I just kept around there, kept drawing down people, kept drawing down people, kept drawing down people, until they just got to be six of us in the Delta. Uh, Jim Mulaney, Tom Fosmer, and myself, Mac Little, uh, Don Keynes, and Glenn Roundsville. And Mac, uh, not Mac, uh, Sarge. Sarge. Is that six? Who's counting? Who's listening out there? <laughs> There's six or seven of us there. And Phyllis. Phyllis, it was uh, Jim Mulaney's secretary. She was eventually killed in uh, Lebanon. Uh, they count me because I was good friends with Air America. Air America was the only way to get around out in the outback. You want to go out from Saigon or you want to go out from Canto or any place, you're not going to try the roads. Nobody knew anymore what was safe and what wasn't safe. Only way you had to go was Air America. And Air America would not fly for anybody. These were practice risk takers. And especially they didn't like State Department. And especially they didn't like the Consular General of Canto. The only guy really down there that would work for is me. And we'd spent two years together. One of my best friends ever was George Taylor. And George Taylor would come down often and would fly the skies and do what was necessary. And go what was necessary. Do the, the Consular General's bidding and going out and locating people. So they kept me because um, I offered them Air America. And they also kept me because of my access to Joe Hong and Joe High, and it was coming down to a point where the Arden um, was reported and I reported. And I reported became more and more uh, contrary to Saigon. And finally, the chief of station came down to Jim Delaney and said, Stop all this doomsday reporting. It's not that bad. I know. Stop it. And Delaney said, I'll, I'll do what I can. But Delaney also not lended himself to, to his boss in the way that I suggested has been done before with intelligence people. If you, if you get browbeat or you get uh, pushed into a position where they're asking for you to make intelligence to, to support their position, it's not good intelligence. So Delaney, he, he kept his integrity about him as an intelligent professional, and we kept sending out doomsday reported. Wherever I went, wherever George Taylor took me uh, in the Delta, it was not looking good. More and more of the VC were in control and the businessmen were covering their belts. They were making, they were making nice with the VC. Uh, everybody was expecting North Vietnam to take over the country soon. So I reported was, and then Frank Schnepp came down. He was the DDI guy. And he talked to us and said, you guys don't know what you're talking about. He said, there's going to be a negotiated ceasefire. Stop sending out all this stuff. The North Vietnamese are going to take over. Now, if you read my book, you'll, you'll, I'll, this is all explained about how we went we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with, uh, with Frank Snuff and Hogarth. Those are the two reasons that I stayed. My solid friendship with Hong, and I think Hai allowed me to come out and see him all the time. Uh, because uh, he could use his English only. Because he could see the shock effect he could make with some of his customers. <laughs> and then Air America. I had, I had good, good friends. Uh, Izzy Freeman, one of the reasons my wife was comfortable early on is in Udor, when I was up country, Izzy Freeman was an uh, Air America pilot. 
He's still in Thailand, as he is, but uh, he was like a brother to her. Well, that's the way she describes it. <laughs> Uh, so here is the here is the contentious uh, this this battle we have between Saigon Station, which had direct feed into the White House, and Canto, we had direct feed into the intelligence community. We could not reach customers that Station could, but all of our reporting said the end is near. Let's let's do what's necessary to uh, for, for the final shutting of that door, and Washington. Washington didn't say, Washington was supportive. They kept saying, send more. And the stuff that I was getting from Hong and Hai, I was later to receive a pretty good award in the agency. And a lot of it had, had to do with Hong's and Hai's reporting at the end. We sort of countered a lot. And they would see all this, this mush coming from Saigon Station and, and Ambassador Mark, and then you would have some report uh, from Hai and Hong, and it sort of balanced things. Uh, and also we were having trouble with the Kanjian in Kanto. Jim Delaney was saying uh, that uh, if we go out, if we have to leave, and, and let's, let's discuss this, he would say, we, if we have to leave, uh, we're going to go out by Air America helicopter. And the Kanjian said, no. He said, I'm going to control the manifest, and we're going to go down the Basic River. And, and we said, that's stupid. That's crazy. It's going to be a spent battlefield in the Basic River. I mean, you're captive right there. You don't know who controls the shoreline. I mean, you, you can be plucked right out of a boat. It's going to be hard for them to pluck you out of an Air America helicopter. And it went back and forth. The, the kind general said, I'm going to control the manifest. And General Lane said, I've got some people that have worked for the CIA who will certainly be shot if we don't get them out. And I have a responsibility to them. And he said, go fly a kite. I want to control the manifest. So that was going on. It was, there was a lot going on. And then the fire. The, there was a, um, a um, incendiary bomb that came and landed near the consulate in, in the Delta one night. This is, probably, um, this is probably early April. Early April. And this big fire started, and it was blowing towards the consulate. And Don Keynes was on duty that night, and uh, Glenn Roosevelt made his way there, and I made my way there, and we see him. He opened up the window, and here's this firestorm. It was something like going with the wind. I mean, this is you know, Atlanta has been raised. The fire is coming this way. So we called up Delaney, and Delaney said, "Well, destroy all the fogs, get rid of it. all the fogs, everything you got. Get rid of it. So we got rid of it." And then he said, "The fire is getting bigger, and it's getting hotter." And he said, okay, I destroyed the money. And he gave us the combination to the, to the base safe. And we'd just gotten in a big shipment of money to pay off our assets. And inside that safe was money. So Don Keynes is doing something. Glenn Roundsville and I opened that safe and looked up, and you've never seen so much money. You talk about an awe inspiring moment looking at all that cash. So we went back to the lane and said, now, are you sure you want to destroy this money? He said, yes, destroy it all. So we put it all in burn bags, but we just couldn't. We couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they saw the taxpayers. They made all this money, and they needed us to destroy it. And we did. So we took it out of the burn bag, we put it in boxes, and we put it in the back of the car. Glenn and I were convinced. You can't come home from a, you know, a small country town. You can't destroy that much money. Burning that much money, I don't care. So we had it in the trunk of our car. Uh, and as it happened, the fire burned itself out right before it got to the consulate. And we carried the money back, and the guy counted it the next morning. And he found it out. But then he said, you shouldn't have worried about it. He said, all the money is in, in sequence here. We just got a draw from the Treasury Department. And if it gets destroyed, we just you know, erase it from the, from the book. Taxpayers don't lose that money. I said, all right, they ask you to destroy all that money, see what you do. And then, then there were the warehouses. Now, from 73, when the military left, uh, they, they had these different officer clubs and NCO clubs and the SEALs club and the Navy clubs and, and the British clubs and the Australian clubs. And, and the clubs just kept getting smaller. And the really premium stuff was being left to the other clubs that remained behind. Well, when it got down to six CIA guys, 
maybe six uh, State Department guys, then all that stuff sort of belonged to us. Where was it? It was in warehouses out by the, by the airport. We dreamed about, not dreamed, we talked about it. Yeah, what's in all those warehouses out there that's been collecting that stuff? And one day we came in and the, uh, the logistics guy was being sent out. And on Phyllis's desk were all these keys. And I was with uh, the Sarge, he was a Vietnamese linguist. And we said, look at all those keys. What did they go to? She said, all the warehouses out there. And he said, who do they belong to? You, so you, you take them. So we said, okay. So we, we pushed them all off into one or two boxes. And uh, the Sarge and I went out to the warehouses. Big compound. They had Filipino uh, guards and they had uh, Nung guards. And, and they had some uh, other nationalities that were guarding this place. And we had to have the right pass. So we looked through our keys. The up here's a pass. And he let us in. And, the, and it was just row after row after row of warehouses of this stuff that the American consulate had inherited from how many thousands of clubs before. So we, some, some of we, we tried to get into it. We just couldn't find the right key. We opened up one, though. And it had in one end of this warehouse pistols. Every kind of pistol you can imagine. Pistols that were from belt buckets, uh, belt buckles, and pistols that were big and long, and pistols that had scopes on them, all kinds of pistols. And they were, why they were protected by chicken wire, but that's what they had, so it was separate. You had other crates of weapons over here, burnt guns and carbines and AK-47, just crates and crates on them. Went to a, another one, and it looked like this. It looked like just a box. Remember the, uh, the, um, uh, Indiana Jones and, and, and the last scene. Yeah. That's what it looked like. These warehouses filled with these boxes. And nobody knew any much. You know who owned them? Sarge and I. There are boxes that we got to keep. But what are you doing? with them? And plus, you know, we had to open up those crates and we didn't have a hammer. And so we carried all the keys back. And I don't know what Phyllis did with them. I think she just left them there on the back desk. But there, there it was. That was that experience. Almost like all that money in the safe when Joe and Lady told us to run. So one day I was coming in from, I don't know where, and we were closing compounds out of the field. So I was dragging ass in one afternoon, and Glenn Ronsabell said there was somebody he wanted me to meet. So I went up to his office, and he had this Vietnamese woman there, beautiful Vietnamese woman. If Brenda had seen a picture of him, she had been mighty, mighty fearful. That was one gorgeous woman. And she was wearing the Aoyai, you know, which is the Vietnamese dress and the white pants. And, um, she was looking for someone to adopt her two children. She said, uh, and th another sign that the people, the, the uh, groundswell opinion was that the North Vietnamese were going to be, were going to be proprietors here soon. Uh, she wanted somebody to take her kids out. There were, they were fathered by two different GIs. Uh, and she said that she would give them up for adoption uh, if we would please take them out. And I don't know, I may, I'm a soft touch for kids anyway. And Glenn didn't do it, but I agreed to do it. I called Brenda that night, I, but I didn't agree to do it. I called Brenda that night and she said uh, yes. Uh, if, because what they did, when the French lost in Hanoi, the Viet Minh came in and they killed all half French. Uh, half Vietnamese kids. She was afraid that was the fate, would be the fate of her kids. They would be killed just like they were in 54 when the Viet Minh came in and they killed all the half French kids. So Brenda said, uh, okay, but let the mother know for sure that uh, my sympathy is with her, my heart is with her, but she cannot come back later on and try and, and, and regain those kids. You're not just transportation for them out. So I explained that to her. I, I live with a hard-hearted woman. And this is, she said, are, are the rules. I'll come by and pick up those kids if we have to leave. And I will take them out and we will adopt them and we will give them good home. Now the reason Glenn uh, made that introduction uh, was because he knew we had adopted uh, two kids. Uh, so I went by a couple of days later to the address she gave me where they live and I met the two kids. Uh, boy, I'll tell you, the boy was, he was all boy. He had spunk and he was on the chair behind me and, and the girl was trying to figure me out. I don't know what the mother had told her who I was, but uh, I was pretty curious to him. 
and the girl, a beautiful, beautiful uh, Vietnamese American girl, and the boy. But he was the boy was just a boy. He was like I don't know two or three or four, but he was just all over the place. And uh, the mother and I talked, and I said, "You got to have this suitcase packed by the door." And my wife said she would go along with it if you understand that this is forever. And she said she did. She understood. So um, I got to know the kids. I went back a another time, and uh, and the kids were the kids. I think the girl was a little more comfortable with me uh, in talking. No, there was no touching. Although the boy was in my lap, looking at my face, playing with my glasses. Uh, and the mother hated me. Though. It was clear by the time I left that second night, she hated me because I represented whatever it was that had given her these two children, and I represented whatever it was that was now taking them away. The third time I met her, and I think I only met them three times, she really did hate me, but she had those two little suitcases by the front door. They were yellow and, and uh, red and Disney characters from the outside. One was packed for the girl, and one was packed for the guy. And, but she, was, she hated me, but she made me promise absolutely I'd come by and pick her up. Uh, if we were evacuated. I said, I will. I will not have a minute to spare. I drive up. The kids get in my Jeep and we go. And that was it. My visit to, um, to High continued, uh, and he was more of a source of information for me than Hong was. Hong got involved in politics towards the end, and then Hong was preoccupied with his own plan. But Hai was always there for me, to chew my butt to rip me up, to call me new names I didn't know. Uh, I can't repeat them now. I just, it was just... Um, but then about 12 April, Frank Church, well, it was a Senate uh, Finance Committee that voted to, to turn off all the money to South Vietnam. It was about 12th of April. And I was afraid to go out because I knew the news. I don't know how he got it. Somebody heard it. And he always knew the news almost before I did. He would, he would tell me things that the news had said. And I knew that he would have heard that our Senate was turning off all the money to him. So I feared for my life. The pilot who was flying for me, for me there was a guy named Cliff Hendricks. He was an old poker, but he was just, he wasn't as close as I was to George. But uh, Cliff and I had flown a lot of hours. I said, Cliff, I think this guy might be thinking about killing me if I go out there. So this time, I don't want you to drop me off and then leave. I want you to drop me off, and I want you to shut the helicopter down and stay close to the tent while I'm in talking to General Hawk. And he agreed because, because uh, I asked him to. So I went in that day and uh, opened the door and walked down those pallets to his desk, and he's small, sort of a smoke screen because he chain smoked all the time. And I sat down, and he stood up. And for the first time, maybe he had he wore that gun before, but I noticed he had a gun and a holster at his side. And I didn't, when I went to see the general, I didn't carry uh, a weapon. Maybe I carried a gun. I don't know. But anyway, I noticed he had a gun, and his gun was out. From, and his hand was out from the gun, and he had, in fact, heard that our government was turning off all money to it. Not that it had been good money before, because the spare parts hadn't worked, but uh, it certainly meant the end. This is 12 April. Uh, and I think there was, there was a time when he considered killing me. Uh, there was, there was, it was too quiet. His anger was too, I mean, his eyes were too deep set or something. And then it passed, and he went back to calling me names and how we had uh, messed this war up, the way we prosecuted it. And, uh, and so I, and then he slowed down and after a while sort of spit, sat in his chair and we talked about what was happening. He said that when this group right across from him began to line up with the bridge units in the front and then brand new units of uh, soldiers behind him and then uh, the third group again, old experienced soldiers behind him, when they began to line up, he figured Saigon would fall in seven days. Now, he didn't say it that, that succinctly, but that's what, when he repeated himself and we summarized, that's what he said. That when they lined up, it's sort of a battle formation, 
he thought it would take them seven days to get to the end side of Saigon. So Saigon would fall in seven days. So I went back and I told Delaney he was fortunate they hadn't seen him yet because I'd almost been shot dead. Uh, but this is what he had said. I don't think we set out anything that day about that, uh, uh, about that guess on his part. Uh, but then a few days later, I was out visiting Hyde, and he said, they're lining up. Uh, this must have been the 22nd of uh, April. He said, they're lining up, Saigon will fall in a week. So I came back to, uh, to, to Jim, and, and uh, we talked about it. Now, this is really going to go in the face of Saigon Station. We're going to say Saigon is going to fall in seven days. Uh, but he finally said, it's, it's what we have to do. So I went down and I wrote up the cable and I began with the very first sentence. And then the way I had been taught in Intel training, you know, you get your strongest point in the first sentence, the first paragraph, and then support it. Uh, but the Saigon would fall in seven days, April the 29th. And we set it out, expecting a firestorm coming down from Saigon Station. Now, reports in the agency are, are great. They were graded at the time. If your report is, if you send it up and it's not disseminated because it's bad information or it's sort of off the mark or whatever, it, you get an ND, non dissent If you send it up and it goes out and it's sort of, you know, just so a little bit there, so that you get a one. If you send something out, the German grade is five. You try for a five. That advances our understanding of the subject. If you send something out and you're really starting to answer the question, that's a 10. If the president looks at it, that's a 20. In my career, I got two 20s. And I've often thought, that's what I want on my headstone. Men got two 20s. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that cable eventually got a 20. The Saigon would fall in seven days. So that, and we sent that out at night. And another thing, too, about how how important it was to Delaney about sending it out at night. You will find if you've been chief of station or chief of base, you don't send out anything at night. You just don't. You just let it sit overnight, and you'd be surprised how many mistakes you'll find in the morning. Because you send out anything at the end of the day when you're tired, and you can't, you know, uh, if you send out a misspelled word, and my typewriter did not have spell check. So if, <laughs> if, you, if you've got something important to send out, it's going to get some people to look at it. You let it sit. But with that intel, we sent it out that night. And we must have spelled all the words, uh, the words right. Nothing back in Saigon. Uh, and we sort of, we sort of shut down. The next meeting, the next morning, Fosmar was in charge. And it was, okay, we've got seven days, what do we do? And we decided we have to identify the people that we have an obligation to get out. We are the CIA. Who have worked for the CIA for a long period of time who would certainly be shot if the North Vietnamese came in? And we got that list. We could not include uh, guards. We could not include uh, office workers. We could include some translators. But that's it's sort of the end was the, the, the end question would this person be killed if the North Vietnamese came in? And if, they, if the answer to that was probably yes, then they stayed on our list. So then we started rounding these people up. Day two and three, we were sort of rounding these people up. We had several areas where we were bringing them to. And then from Saigon by this time, they were just going crazy. The, the, the stuff they were sending out made no sense. It was like they had drunk the Kool-Aid or something. Uh, but in the Delta, we, we stopped sort of sending out stuff. And our job was collecting our key, key indigenous personnel. It was during that time that I also went by and saw, uh, and saw the, the mother and the two kids. I think that was the last time as we were, uh, as we were getting ready uh, to get our kill. Uh, then it came up on like five days since General High said, um, I, I went out to, to try and find General High uh, like two days after that last meeting when he said Saigon would fall in seven days, and he'd already uh, struck camp, and he was on the move. The last time I saw General High was uh, that meeting when he said Saigon would fall in seven days. Um, so we, we collected our people. We sent Glenn Roosevelt to Saigon to try and get some word from him 
from Hogar or Ambassador Martin or Jacobson, who was our best bet. Jacobson was the ambassador's ombudsman. He was his uh, aide. So Glenn went up, uh, so this is the sixth day. Saigon, according to our timetable, is going to fall the next day. And he went into Martin's outer office, Ambassador Martin, and it's chaos.